Hello, everyone. You're listening to the LockingYourSuccess.com Trading Performance Podcast with Master Trading Performance Coach John Locke, where it's all about real traders, real problems, and real coaching. Today, I'd like to share an interview I had. But before I do, I'd like to say a warm thank you to Sylvia, her crew, and her listeners for allowing me to share such an important topic. And I had a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed it immensely. Now, without further ado, I'd also like to share it with you. So here is the interview. Enjoy. And I take 100 long-term successful traders with great results, and we look at their rules, and we look at their indicators, we look at what they're doing, and they're all different. What does that mean? Well, we want to find that out. What is it that the successful traders have in common if it's not the indicator, if it's not the, um, um, not the rule set? Their expectations tend to be similar. Their attitude towards trading tends to be similar. Their attitudes towards uncertainty, their attitude towards um, um, losses, all are similar. Their principles of how they approach the market, they're all similar. Yes, but a rule set, typically no. So they all have an effective method of gauging and acting upon great risk-reward probability decisions. Understand that trading is about risk, reward, and probability. If you are taking on an appropriate amount of risk versus how much you're willing to make and the probability of that happening is high, you will make money trading. You're going to lose trades. You're going to run through cycles of where you make money and where you have losses. But if you'll always have risk, reward, and probability, if that combination of numbers is always in your favor, you will make money over the long term if you're persistent enough to push through the losses and continue to trade the same size um, and push through the uncertainty. The other thing is that these traders are willing to risk failure at, at an unconscious level. They're completely willing to risk failure. And they have the ability to properly interpret their feedback and they have the, therefore, they have the ability to learn from their result. And when they can do that, when you can properly learn from your results, you can adjust your process. You have to have the ability to lose a trade and then go back and review your trade and say, oh, I did everything right. I did the right thing. I can reward myself. And you also have to have, to have the ability and the habit of reviewing your winning trades And you have to be able to take a look at a winning trade and say, oh, you know what? I traded this like a complete, you know, idiot. I I traded this terribly, even though I won. And identify that so that you can – and when you can do that, you can properly interpret what's going on with your trades. So one of the things that we have in coaching and – is we have what's called a thought model. Realize that there's a circumstance that is a fact. There's a thought about that circumstance. The thought creates an emotion. Your actions are always based off of your emotions. I know we haven't talked about this uh, before. People think it's based off logic or whatever, but your actions and non-actions are always based off of emotions. That's the way the human being works. And your action is going to produce a result. When we're going through this model, there's a problem between circumstance and thoughts. Most people believe that their, um, circ- their thoughts are true. Their thoughts are not true. You could have a circumstance where you entered a trade. The trade cost you uh, $5,000, and you returned $4,000, meaning that if you did the math, you now have $1,000 less than you did when you started the trade. I'm often told, well, I lost the trade. If, If that statement for you is an emotionally charged statement, that's not a circumstance. The fact, the circumstance or fact is that you now have a thousand less dollars than you had before. The thought might be that I lost the money, which creates an emotional charge. That emotional charge is going to create an action or a non-action, and that action or non-action is going to create a result. This is what we use when we coach people. 
when we get deeper into that, when we start using hypnotherapy, when we start doing NLP work and change work, we want people to actually uh, produce changes in people at a deeper level, we have what we call the extended thought model. The extended thought model <clears throat> goes like this. You have an unconscious belief or expectation. You have a belief of the way I am or you are, and you have a belief of the way the world is, or at least the way that it should be. Then something happens. You have a circumstances, a circumstance, which is your actual experience. What your brain does is it compares your actual experience to the way you believe you are and the world is. It makes that comparison. That comparison creates thoughts, both unconscious and sometimes conscious, about the comparison. Those thoughts create an emotion. The emotion shifts you into what we call a thought map or a thought filter. Realize that when you, when you have a certain emotion as a human being, you delete, distort, generalize, and filter information in a different way. And that information has different meanings to you. And if, you ha if you're in, a, in an intense state of emotion, half of that information completely disappears. So if I'm very angry, I'm going to, my map is going to shift, and I'm going to pay attention to things that reinforce the emotion of anger, that per perpetuate the emotion of anger. I will completely ignore or distort any information that opposes that. This process reinforces the emotion until it creates an urge. It's not until this point that you're actually consciously aware of it. All this has happened usually beneath your conscious awareness. All you understand is, hey, I, have an ur I feel a certain way and I have an urge to do something. From there, what we call the rational lying brain gets involved. Your rational mind that lies to you. Your logical mind at that point its first default job is to create a rational story as to why you should take an action on this urge. You do have the chance to interrupt it here. This is the moment between your decision and your action, right? This is a statement that we were talking about earlier with Viktor Frankl. This is the moment between your, between your stimulus and your response. A lot of times, the reason this is in orange is because a lot of times this is completely skipped. For a lot of people who are not aware, they're going to have that urge. They're going to automatically take an action or non-action as a result of that urge. They're going to get their result. This is where you can come in and you can interrupt this process and you can make a different logical decision. Again, being aware that you're your logical mind, first and foremost, is going to try to create a logical story as to why you should be able to, why you should do whatever this urge is. And we can take a look at this with trading, but we can also take a look at it with like dieting, right? You said to yourself, I'm not going to eat cake tonight because I'm on a diet. You come in and, and you run through this process. The emotion is formed. The filter map is selected. You're, it reinforces the emotion that comes. You get that urge. And then you make a logical justification as, why it's, as to why it's okay to eat the cake. It's okay to just have a little bit, right? And then once you start, you keep going. And this process runs itself and runs itself. Anyway, what you have is you have that action or non-action. You have the result. You have the unconscious interpretation of that result based on your beliefs and expectations, right? So you went through this process, you got a result, and then you say, oh, well, uh, th and then your mind says, well, was that the right thing to do? Well, did it reinforce this? If it did, it was the right thing to do. If it didn't, it was the wrong thing to do. And then you can, put, you can possibly have a conscious interpretation of the result, which may change this, when we have a conscious interpretation of a result, we want to reframe the experience to purposely shift the belief if we want to shift the belief. And then from there, we get a belief reinforcement or a deterioration of the belief, okay, depending on our results. So 
that's what we're going through all the time, all the time, all the time. If you have an unconscious belief that you expect to win all the time, and then you do your trade and your circumstances, you lost. You compare this. I'm supposed to win all the time. I lost. I have a thought about that. Right? I'm supposed to win all the time. I lost. This, this means I'm a failure. This means this. This means that. It prompts an emotion or, I'm, or I don't know what I'm doing. It prompts an emotion of maybe fear. That emotion shifts your perceptual filters in a way that reinforces the emotion, creates an urge to do something. Say I'm in a trade. The trade's drawn down. Um, the trade's drawn down. It's not supposed to be drawn down. I'm not supposed to draw down if I'm doing the right thing. I, can, I have a thought about that. That creates an emotion of fear. I shift my perceptual filters. Now I'm looking at all the information that tells me I'm going to lose the trade. Something's gone wrong. This is going to continue to happen. My trading plan says to stay in, but I, I'm feeling all these emotions. I'm feeling this fear. I'm feeling all this stuff going on, and those emotions are being reinforced. Therefore, I have the urge to break my plan and exit the trade. This is where a lot of times we skip the next two sessions. We take the action of exiting the trade. The result is I lost the trade because I got out when – Right, you know, maybe the trade came back later or whatever. I lost the trade. The result is the trade was bad. Right, my unconscious interpretation was the trade I took was bad. I did something wrong, and then of course that believes the reinforcement of the belief that uh, if I did something right, I shouldn't have been drawn down money, and that just runs into this vicious circle where you can never really make anything as a trader. Right, you're you're switching strategies and you're continuing to break plan. Now, we can interrupt that at the conscious awareness level when this happens, and then we can interrupt that, and then we can, and then we can logically evaluate uh, uh, how we logically evaluate the fact that, hey, we made a trading plan because we know this is the best probability thing to do. Therefore, I'm going to stick with that plan, and you can make the decision that's different to stick with the plan, and then, of course, you have the next hurdle to deal with, which, which is your unconscious interpretation of that because if you stick with your plan and you lose your unconscious is going to decide you did the wrong thing and reinforce a, a different belief if you lose and you interrupt that you can reframe it and train yourself that that was the right thing to do and i need to keep doing that even though i lost this time so this is where the next uh, level comes in then of course if you win your unconscious interpretation is you did the right thing consciously you may or may not have done the right thing if you followed your plan you probably did so you want to let that belief run through and so forth. So that's essentially how that works. I don't know if you have any questions or anything. All right. Thank you for that detailed presentation. Yes, that was quite, that was quite interesting. Thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. I can see some questions coming, coming through. I also have um, one that I'd also like to ask maybe before I go to um, our, our, uh, the, the people who joined in. Um, and the questions, maybe I have one. Um, I'm quite curious about the 10% in your study uh, of the 100 traders, uh, whereby there were about 70 of them who are getting to break even, um, about 30% uh, of them were losing terribly, and there was 10% that was consistent. Whether you, whether they were, you gave them a, a, a strategy that was proven to work, or whether you had given them a strategy that you knew was going to fail, they still somehow continue to perform well. Um, were there other similarities about that group? Maybe uh, something like um, were they trading for a living, or was it like an invest? Uh, was it like a, an investment for them, a long-term investment? Were there other metrics maybe um, so, to use? Yeah, so the type of trading we're doing, just for a reference point, is complex options trading, and it's a strategy game, kind of like chess. So there are what we call gray areas in any tra set of trading rules. So those gray areas are what, like when you're near an indicator or you're just past an indicator or just past an adjustment point. 
and you know other things that happen too is your execution. You're going to come in and people are going to get executed at different prices, meaning that if you have a profit target, you're going to be ed exiting at different points and, and things like that, right? So during the trading, these people, they're, they're making, they're constantly making these decisions of, of when exactly to get out and when exactly to get in and when exactly to what we call do adjustments. And it's in these gray areas that people do well. So, for example, our strategies, they, for the most part, they win 80% of the time um, if you backtest them, okay? But the reality is, is there's a certain percentage of, of trades what we call slam dunk winners. We have 60% of trades that if you follow the rules even loosely, you're going to win. You could, you could have made a lot of different decisions along the way. And then they have these, you know, maybe 10 or 20% of the trades that, um, that are just slam dunk losers. You do anything within the rule set, the trade's going to lose. And then there's this wide range of trades where we ran across gray areas. And if you made different decisions at those points, you may have won or you may have lost the trade. And that's the difference between the winning and losing traders because the traders who are losing that percentage of trades, even though they're technically following the rules or at least in their mind they're following the rules, a lot of times they'll vary from the rules or they'll break the rules. So a certain percentage of traders, even though I gave them the rules, are going to break the rules. In other words, they're yeah. not doing the same thing. And you can even see this with trade alerts. I've seen tra tra people who do trade alerts and the trade alerts win perfectly fine and they lose. Right, they're making different decisions. I'm thinking, sure you've probably seen this with people as well, or maybe you've experienced it yourself. And it's in these decision points, in the way people are reacting to them, where they're ultimately going to win or lose. And the other huge thing is position sizing. What you'll see is position people will do this. They they're not confident in the strategy, so they start out very small position sized. Mm -hmm. They use short-term results, which are luck-driven, to decide whether or not they should be confident. If they win, they crank their size up, especially if they win four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten trades. Their size is huge, okay? And then they lose the trade on a very large capital size, and then they drop their size back down again meaning that the person who came in started trading large and continued to trade large or even the same size won money over that period of time the person who's fluctuating their position size with their results that are luck driven they've lost money can you see how that happens yes, yes. right because because they get it to this really huge size they lose money they drop down and then they're trading a small size, they're gonna take some forever to make the money back or they'll never make the money back. And they just run through that process over and over and over again, sometimes with the same strategy, sometimes through different strategies, they're just never gonna make money. Thank you, I think that, that, that now makes um, a whole lot more sense. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of things going on in the background that, that people don't even consider, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I've also seen that uh, difference in results, even in trading groups, where you're all taking the same trade, but <laughs> the results are different. <laughs> Everyone has a different result based on how yeah. they were managing the trade. And you're like, how can that happen? But it happens. Yes, it's true. Yeah. All right. So I'll also take in some uh, questions. So anyone who's joined in today, kindly put your questions in the Q&A area, and our guest, Mr. Locke, will answer. So there's Al Albert S has asked a question. How do you use hypnosis to calm the mind? Well, first of all, we can, we can talk about hypnosis. We can talk about meditation. It's essentially, they're essentially very similar, right? So you have guided uh, meditation. You, you can do hypnosis and stuff like that. But part of that is understanding that your emotions are not you. So people believe their emotions. They think that they're, they're real and, and, and we want to be able to separate from our emotions. And we can accomplish that through hypnosis. We can accomplish it through uh, meditation. But part of that is noticing just uh, where you sit there and you notice thoughts come into your head. And then you just disassociate from them, essentially. You let them go. And you let them pass by you. And there's a tremendous power in being able to separate your thoughts 
from from yourself. Again, you are not your thoughts. Your brain is going through all this stuff, but it's not you. You're not your beliefs. You don't have to believe anything. Okay, you have an emotional reaction to something because you have a belief in, a, in a, you have a belief in an expectation that it is not being met. And that belief and expectation has nothing to do with reality. If you talk to 100 different people and you ask them about the exact same subject, you're going to find many different beliefs on that subject, right? You're going to have many different beliefs on what things mean, and you'll have many different beliefs about how the world is supposed to be. And the thing is, we believe that our belief is true, but it's not true. And being able to understand that and disassociate from it and being open to to saying that our expectations, our beliefs around the world are not reality and understanding that and being open to other people's interpretations of beliefs and so forth is a big part of that. So realize you're upset because your belief or expectation isn't being met. And a lot of times it goes with just being able to break free from that belief or expectation, being able to separate from it and consider other types of things. Does that make sense? And then we can, we can accomplish that with hypnosis. We can, change, we can literally change your beliefs and values and so forth. Realize that the beliefs that you have, who, who decided what those beliefs are? Chances are it wasn't you. Chances are those were things that were put into your mind through random people who happened to raise you, random people you met through your life, um, random experiences you have that you apply a meaning to. That's what the unconscious mind does. You had no, you have to remember, you had no rational reasoning filters in your brain until you were five to seven years old, meaning that everything you experienced, everything that was told to you simply went in. You simply believed that to be true. You simply believed that to be the way of the world. It wasn't until you were about seven years old where you were even able to begin to start to rationalize things and decide whether they're true or not. The problem is that you're rationalizing things based on the information that's already in there. Therefore, you don't believe what's true. You believe what's familiar. Yeah. And you build on the fact that it's familiar. And that familiar have, may have no basis in reality, but you're making, you're making rational decisions off of false information, mm. which is pretty interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> that means that um, you pretty much have to question already uh, what you believe and put it to the test, which uh, I think most people tend not to want to do, to question um, their own reality. But well, I the think... thing is, it, does it really even matter if it's true? What really matters is, is, it, is what I believe beneficial to what I'm trying to accomplish? Or is it not beneficial? If what you believe is not beneficial, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Because most of the stuff isn't true, or it, it, any of the, a lot of the stuff you think is true can be interpreted a different way where it's not true. Right? So the question becomes, is, is what I believe and think providing me with the emotions that I need to take the actions that I need to take that are going to give me the result that I want. If the answer is no, then you need to, you need to look into changing your beliefs, changing your expectations around trading. If the answer is yes, then, you know, reinforce them. All right. That makes sense. Um, there's a question from Patrick. He's saying that um, he's been trading on a demo for some time and um, you'd want to transition into live. And uh, so he's saying that he's been trying to tune his mind um, to a live environment and he seems to be having a problem. So what should he do? He should do it anyway. So here's the thing. Why, why do we have trouble jumping into a live environment? Lack of confidence, which you're not going to get until you've traded a live environment. Um, fear of loss which you're going to lose. So you need to work with your mind and say, you know what? Let's just take a certain amount of money that I'm willing to completely lose and start getting some experience. 
you got to get in there and get their experience. What people do is they stay in simulation forever until they convince themselves that they finally found the strategy where they're never going to lose, right? They have an unconscious expectation that they're not going to lose if they trade well. If they know enough information, they're not going to lose. But the reality is you are going to lose. That's part of trading. It's part of the game. And you have to get used to those losses. Therefore, just say, you know what? I don't have to be perfect. It doesn't, you know, you're placing a meaning on a loss that, that it's some crazy meaning on a loss where it's this terrible, awful thing instead of seeing it as a normal circumstance, right? I can, I can read books all day long about how to ride a unicycle, but the reality is I'm never going to be able to ride a unicycle unless I get on a unicycle and I fall like a hundred times, no matter how much I read. No matter how much I do it, if it's simulated or a computer or whatever. I got to get on there. I have to fall. I have to get my scrapes and bruises. It's simply what you have to do, right? So you got to you got to man up and and do it. <laughs> and, and it's okay to lose. It's it's normal. I can tell you that any any successful traders lost more times than you can imagine. So it's just part of the process. Yes, and it, it seems to be something that's quite consistent that you never fully know how to trade up and until you get to a live environment. Um, you'll, ne I, you'll never fully know how to trade even after you've traded 10 years in a live environment because things are always changing. Things are always new. You're mm -hmm. always going to experience a loss. It's, it's a continual learning process for as long as you trade for the rest of your life. You're always going to have uncertainty. You have to get over that uncertainty. You're always going to have the possibility of losses. It's just part of the deal. If you want to play the game, that's the game. Mm -hmm. That's the game. And we have to be able to recognize this, right? So, again, that goes, gets back to the expectation that you're supposed to win all the time and that if you're good, the expectation that if you lose, you're a failure, right, or the belief that you, if you lose, you're a failure. That's not true. It's not benefiting you. So that's my thought on that. <laughs> Okay, so there's uh, an anonymous attendee, and he or she is saying, uh, how can one reconcile bias and consciousness, especially when you're a beginner trader with, inex with an inexperienced uh, strategy and possibly trading um, on the fear of losing? How do you mitigate this and follow a consistent strategy? So the beginning of that question was what? Um, so uh, he or she is saying, how do you reconcile bias and, I guess not uh, consciousness, but maybe reality, uh, mm -hmm. what you're biased uh, towards and what um, the reality is, and how do you mitigate that in following a, a rational strategy, especially if maybe you fear a lot about losing. So how do you overcome that? Okay. So first of all, with the strategy. What you want to do is you want to understand a couple of things. Number one is why does that strategy work? What edge is present in that strategy? That, why is it working in the marketplace? What's the edge present in that strategy? You know, if we have an uptrending market, you can do all sorts of strategies that win if the market goes up. And you can win most of the time because the market's going up and the edge in that strategy is the market's going up or the market's trending, the edge in that strategy happens when the market's trending. And we see this with, with, um, with traders all the time, especially swing traders. Hey, I've traded this for two years now and, and I'm making a ton of money and, and, and that means that my strategy's good and I'm gonna win forever into the future and uh, I'm gonna be able to go out and trade full time. And I say, uh, well, what are you gonna do when your strategy stops working? And they look at me like I have two heads. But it's always worked. And it's like, well, no. You understand that that type of strategy, when you go into a sideways market, loses. You're going to get chopped up. It's, it, you know what I mean? When the market goes sideways, you're going to be putting trades on. You're going to be stopping out, putting trades on, stopping out over and over and over again. And it's not going to work again until it gets, it gets, it, you start trending again. And that's just an example of somebody not understanding, right? They're depending on the strategy rather than understanding the strategy. So it's the same thing here. Your job is to understand 
the strategy, what it, the edge is, and when that strategy, when that edge goes away, so that you can shift strategies into something that has an edge during the new marketplace, whatever that happens to be in the future. So that's the understanding that you really need in the marketplace in order to trade. So if you have the strategy and you understand the strategy, you understand why it has an edge in the marketplace, then you want to trade it for as long as the edge is present. If you're fearful of trading it, it's probably because you're relying on back testing or form fitted testing to create a result that's going to win virtually all the time so that you can tolerate, emotionally tolerate the strategy. The problem is that, is that that's a form fitted fictitious strategy and you can't expect the same results going forward. Okay, so again, we have to go back to the, the part is that trading is a game of uncertainty. There's no definite way to know which way the market's going to go. You can get lucky. You can get unlucky, meaning the losses are going to be there. And you need to be able to accept those losses without considering yourself a failure, without putting a huge meaning on it. I mean, look, if you don't have the money to, to have a loss, you shouldn't be trading, number one, right? If you're trading too large where a loss is going to financially damage you, you shouldn't be trading that size. You need to be trading an appropriate size and where a loss is not a big deal because losses are going to happen. And you also have to be able to think about what meaning you're putting on a loss. So one of the things that we do is what's called a thought download where we will say, okay, I have this fear going into the market. Why do I have the fear? Well, I might lose. So what? What does that mean? You write down what it means. So what? You write down what it means. It's going to, and then you follow it all the way to, you know what, you know what the end result is all the time if you fear something? It's death. <laughs> right? So I lose a trade. So what? What's the big deal about that? Well, it's not the money. Well, what is it? Well, um, it means that I'm a failure. So what? It means that I won't be loved. So what? It means that, uh, you know, I'm going to be isolated and alone. I'm never going to have any money, uh, uh, whatever, right? So what? Well, then I, I die. I might as well be dead, right? So <laughs> That's, that's what your unconscious is doing. The problem is you don't consciously know it. So mm -hmm. you want to go in and you want to challenge all those so what's, right? Mm -hmm. So I lost a trade. So what? So I lost some money. So what? Failure is a natural process of part of learning. It's a natural part of trading. It's always going to be there. So if that, right, right? in other words, you're putting meanings on things or you have beliefs about things where you have a belief that, that, that a loss is – means all this crazy stuff at an unconscious level, but you're just not aware of it. And we need to bring these things out. And once you do, the fear goes away. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That, that, that's a well put out answer. And I think um, for some, it's going to be a bitter pill, but it's a necessary pill that we have to, <laughs> that we have to swallow so that um, we can at least be able to address this challenge of uh, trading psychology, because I can see a few other questions um, were also tied to, to that question, like um, uh, Elizabeth, who uh, was asking about, um, is, it, is it true that Forex is hard, or why is it that people think that it's hard, especially when they make a few losses? Um, then there's also um, someone else who was uh, saying about uh, risk, uh, trading carries risk. It's not suitable for everyone. What do you have to say about that? Maybe at uh, the last. Trading, trading carries risk and what? Uh, trading carries risks. It's not suitable for everyone. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Is it um, a, a true statement or is it that everyone can train themselves to become traders or is it only a certain group well, of people can, be, can become tra traders? Trading carries risk. I think that's a true statement. Um, I think any – look, if somebody in the vast universe of the world can do something, 
you can do something. You can do anything you want. The only thing holding you back are your beliefs and your expectations around that risk. So, so can anybody trade? Yes. Um, can anybody make money trading? And, and I mean, unless you have some sort of a mental, you know, a real physical problem with your brain, the answer is yes, you can. But in order to do so, you're going to have to change some beliefs that you have that revolve around trading and revolve around losses and what that means. Because we, we're all the, you know, we're all different, but we're all the same. We're all human beings. We all have, uh, we all operate in the same way. We all have the same hardware, or at least similar enough where we're all reacting the same way. The only difference is the programming. You know, I can punch poverty into a search engine, and what's the computer going to give me? Right? I can, it's going to give me everything with poverty. It's not going to tell me necessarily how to become rich. It's not going to show me the abundance stuff. And I could, and, and if that's the only information I'm looking at, though, if, I, if I'm punching something into the search engine and that's the only information I'm looking at, I think the world's that way. If I punch something else into the search, you know, so if, you're, if you're, you're, you're putting one thing into the search engine and I'm putting something else in the search engine, we're going to have completely different beliefs. We're going to have a completely different world. We're going to behave in different ways. And it's the same thing here. If you're having these challenges, if you believe that a loss in trading is a failure and that it means something about you that is this terrible thing, you're not going to be able to trade. You can't trade from a place of failure. You can't trade from a place of scarcity. I talk to traders who want to go out full time about this. I say, you really have to consider this. You've been doing well for a while trading. At some point in your trading career, you're going to take a series of losses. You have to think about how that affects you financially, of course, but you also have to think about how that affects you mentally. Once you go into a scarcity mindset as a trader, it is over. It's over. If you're a full-time trader and you go into a scarcity mindset and you become uh, and you let the fear and the uh, anxiety get to you, it's done because then you start dropping your size, you start taking, you start shifting your plans to stuff that you away from your your proven strategies that you know work, and the next thing you know, you're going down the spiral until the until you're essentially you have to go back to your job and. Hmm we need to avoid that at all costs. That is our thing as a trader. We're never going to make money in the scarcity mindset because, and in the fearful mindset. So you're going to do yourself a great favor to get over that now while you're new and accept those losses than you know, practicing this fear for the next 10 years <laughs> and making it stronger and stronger. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So that marks the end of our Q&A session. Maybe I'll hand back to Sylvia. Yeah, and uh, thank you again, John Locke, for your trading insights today. We, I'm sure we have learned something new. And maybe as we conclude, you can tell us how people can get in touch with you, how people can find you. I know you're on Twitter, and then we can end the webinar. Right, so uh, lockinyoursuccess.com, that's L-O-C-K-E, in your success.com is my primary website. Uh, you can get in touch with me there. You can also uh, lock for uh, L O C K E, the number four success is my YouTube channel. So I do a lot of stuff on YouTube. I do trading performance as well as the winning trade, tradingperformance.com, the winning trade.com. Any of those will bring you to me and you can uh, and, and talk to us there. I believe I'm lock for success also in Twitter. So. All right. Yeah, we'll be sure to link down the links on the show notes and we will send you the webinar next week. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. That's we'll awesome. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for joining us, everybody. And thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Right, <laughs>